Uh, good morning. Uh, it's uh, really good to be here. I've travelled down from uh, sunny um, West Yorkshire from Halifax and as I set off this morning the sun was shining. The fact that we've now descended into a bit more of a cloud is nothing to do with Sheffield. Um, Rotherham, I'm sure. Um, my name's Jo Williams. I think you've had a little kind of biography about me on the back of the, on the bottom of the invite for today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, I go around a lot of different places. I was with the Diocese of Peterborough last week doing something very similar. And uh, next week I'm with another diocese, and then the week after that, I'm with, no, actually next week, I'm with the Baptists in uh, the North, Northwest. So um, what we're doing today, uh, and what we're going to be uh, doing in many ways, I'm offering you uh, something which I share with different groups, different situations. And your task is to make it relevant and put it into your context as oversight ministers. Okay, so uh, I think that's really important to, to point out that this stuff is stuff that, uh, I should call it stuff, this learning is um, uh, appropriate and generic. I've not twisted it. There's been no, oh, you need to talk to them about this or this is going on. So if you could, none of that. This is stuff that, <laughs> stuff word again, um, this is appropriate for ministers uh, in oversight, but also in other churches as well. So I hope it will be a helpful day for you. Uh, I've been working in conflict and uh, particularly with churches um, for 24 years. And uh, I am also a Baptist minister. And at the church that I'm a part of, we have a center for peace and reconciliation through dialogue and conversation. And as I'm come here today, I'm also conscious that there are other things that happen at the center, which may be of help and use to you in the work that you do. And so at some point during the morning, if you want to grab me and uh, ask what else we do, uh, then I'd be very happy to, to talk that through. I'm married to Andy. He's also a minister and he uh, is also director of the centre. So we're both directors of the centre and we're both half-time ministers of the church. So our life is pretty full. Uh, two adult daughters, one living in Glasgow, who just moved into our house and I was up there yesterday, uh, moving furniture in a, into a tenement that, to be honest, is very much on my mind. I can't believe that Anyway, <laughs> having walked away from chaos, you know that, that kind of thinking, oh, my little girl is in that chaos up there. So my mind is slightly distracted and I need to bring it back. Good to be with you. We come as whole people. The reason I tell you that about my daughter and my life is because we are sitting here, not just as oversight ministers, not just as a minister of from Blackley Church in West Yorkshire. We come as whole people, the beloved of God. And it's trying to remember that not only are we, and it's quite hard sometimes to see ourselves as made in the image of God and to, that God delights in us, but to see each other and those in our churches as the beloved of God in whom God delights. Um, so, I'm going to uh, divide the, well, we've divided the day into the morning into three sessions. The first session is a generic introduction to the exciting subject of conflict in churches. I'm aware some of you may have done courses with bridge builders or with others. I'm a training partner for bridge builders and uh, there is at least one face I recognize from a bridge builders course. So some of this will be familiar to you, uh, but it's familiar to me because I deliver it a lot and I still learn and still see new things uh, through it. 
The second session of the morning, I would like us to explore a little bit about how conflict impacts ourselves, what it does to us, so that in managing ourselves, it then can be helpful in managing conflict where, where we meet it in our communities. And then a final session of the morning, understanding the part we can take in transforming conflict, in walking towards it, to change the dynamic. Uh, and then this afternoon you will pick up some of the themes uh, and explore it a little bit more in smaller groups. So uh, as a first kind of uh, conversation starter, on the screen you will see uh, some road signs. We're all familiar with road signs. Uh, I'd like you round your tables for a few moments, and if it's a large table of six, you might want to have a slightly smaller conversation of three. It depends if you can all hear each other. Uh, the zumba has descended, noise has descended, so you should be all right. Um, in what ways do these road signs connect with conflict? How do they describe the conflicts that you might meet in your church life, in your community life, uh, maybe even in your home life? Um, because we do all have conflicts in our home lives as well. Uh, how do they describe conflict? How do they image conflict? What can you see? And if there is another road sign that occurs to you that's not on there, Please, by all means, introduce it. So I'll give you one little example. Uh, we are going in my church, are going through, on through a particular subject, uh, and I thought we had got there. But no, at the last meeting, lo and behold, it came up again. We are on the roundabout. We are going round and round the same time. And each time we seem to be getting to an exit to go off on it, um, which I thought we had, actually. Uh, we're back on the roundabout. So uh, maybe there are some that connect with you. So just for five minutes, talk around the table. Hopefully you know each other, but if for any reason you don't know the names of the people sat around your table, will you please introduce yourselves and make sure that you do. Call you back. So, uh, which of these road signs kind of spoke to you in what you you saw? Um, or did any any thoughts? Yes. Yeah, sorry, your name. Tracy. Tracy. Um, the one with the two arrows, one red, one black. Yeah. And, uh, the way that I looked at that was this situation of. It's my right of way, I'm coming through, and you go away. Yes, yes, yeah. At that sense of uh, people feeling that this is clearly the way that we should go, and you just need to allow that to happen. Yeah, and uh, thank you. Others? And it's Diane, yes? Road right. Because sometimes navigating different beliefs in your congregation, yeah. especially if some are very outspoken, but they don't necessarily mesh with beliefs of others. Yeah. So sometimes it's a little bit tricky. You've just got to go back a little bit slower. Thank you. So it's that sense of also not just the, the, the oh, it's going up in a direction perhaps that I didn't want when people uh, come with very strong opinions, a, a little bit like that, you know. Uh, and, and that slippy road sign is, I don't know if any of you have uh, had that experience when you've been driving and the road suddenly does get slippy or icy. In a way, there's, you have to go with it for a bit and you have to turn into it before you can kind of readjust and straighten up. And it's kind of going slower. Perhaps someone's going with it a bit before you can get it back on track. Uh, and you never quite know when it's going to come. That black ice that you just don't know uh, until you're on it. <laughs> and then you know, then you know. Uh, so thank you. And your name? Angie. Angie. Uh, a bit similar to Tracy, but the, the white arrow pointing one way. Yeah. 
thinking of maybe a dominant view where that person thinks this is the right way and I yearn for us all to listen to each other yeah. and hear each other's views. Yes. So that each one can feel heard, even though we may need to be a better yeah. a way forward. Yeah. At least if and it's so often in the language, isn't it, that people use, we think, we feel, uh, as, uh, and they're expressing a oneness, which in many ways is wonderful, uh, that unity. Uh, but there's almost an assumption that we all think and believe the same. And therefore, that use of we feel, we believe, whilst important, <laughs> can also stifle and make it very hard for people to offer a different voice. Yeah, yeah. And um, your name? Toby. Toby? Um, I, I'd like to add my, my favorite boat sign. Um, we've, we've all got one, haven't we? Um, and that's the loose chippings one. Right. Um, oh, I, I like that. that. I know that one of my faults is that I sometimes go at speed and then others get hit by chipping. I love that. That's, I've never thought of that. Thank you, Toby. That sense of, you know, going for it, you know, <laughs> and actually the, the, the unknown chipping sometimes and the damage that that can cause, that one little chip that can go off and, uh, yeah, hit your side of your car or whatever. But if you're on the pavement, it could be quite, quite nasty. What? And we're not necessarily aware of it. Blithely going on and not necessarily aware. Love it. Thank you. Yeah, I will do. I will do. Yeah, I love that one. It's the man with the umbrella, which I think is men at work. It is. Men and women at work yeah. now. It's a more appropriate. Is that actually conflict is hard work because it often arises when you least expect it. Yeah. And you have to react. Uh, at that moment, and then you have to think hard yeah. and pray hard yeah. and say something that just takes the heat out yeah. of the conflict. Thank you. It's yeah. hard work conflict. It is. I always think of that man struggling with an umbrella as well. So, um, the, it is hard work. And we're going to find that uh, what some of the stuff that we'll be talking about today, that, you know, there's not quick fixes. It, it takes time to slow down, to resolve things, to work at it, and to try and, yeah, think creatively around it and give it the time. And that work is for women as well as men. Yeah. <laughs> Any other that gets to you? Sorry, I don't hear your name. Tim. Tim. Tim and Toby and Sibylla. Sibylla. It's a rock falling. <laughs> Things can be absolutely fine for a while, but it's not the person who's got a leadership role in the congregation. It's quite like to love a few rocks. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 And you can never quite predict when those rocks are going to fall. And it can just be one little thing that can set off uh, a greater fall, which can then settle. And then, lo and behold, it can come again. Any others? Speed cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Say more. Slowing me down when I want to go fast. Yeah. Yeah, having those speed cameras that slow us down when we want to go fast. And that actually is a really important thing to think about, actually. Or just even to have, uh, um, not necessarily the speed cameras, the, the speed limit. Oh. limit, that's the word, thank you. Uh, yeah, saying what the speed limit is and reminding us that actually Whilst we might want to power on, maybe this is time to be a little bit slower and more cautious. I think these keep on giving, these road signs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, you've come up with things that other people haven't come out with. And uh, people see different things in them every time I use them. I use them a lot with young people, actually to get them to think about what's going on in conflict uh, when they struggle, perhaps, to, you know, they just get 
this is happening and I don't like it. What, what's happening and, and what are we seeing? Um, I use it with congregations. I sometimes, uh, before a meeting, when we're discussing something quite difficult, I might put these up and say, where are you now? Which of these describes how you're feeling? And it gives people a chance to own how they are feeling in this particular context without feeling they've got to argue for a point of view. They're talking about how they're feeling about it uh, as something we don't always do. Right, clicker. Uh, so, oh, I'd just like to share uh, this image which uh, was given to me by um, someone called Brendan McAllister. You, you probably don't know of Brendan, but he was um, a one-time director of Mediation Northern Ireland. Uh, he went across to the World Council of Churches, um, a Catholic um, deacon, um, but... Uh, Unfortunately, sadly, uh, Brendan ha has died relatively recently. <laughs> we were working together in Northern Ireland uh, with the communities there, and he was trying to explain to uh, activists in the community why conflict occurs. And he tried to he explained it with what he called the conflict tree. He said, in every community, there is diversity. And this is the rich soil that feeds our communities. Diversity is a good thing. <laughs> the trouble is we tend not to see it and recognize it for its richness. We see it as difference. You are different from me. And humankind, uh, homo sapiens, don't tend to be very good with difference. It goes back to our early cave dweller days when if you came out of your cave in the morning and something was different, maybe there was a different smell or a different footprint, it made you alert. Is there danger here? And in a way that still is programmed into us. When we meet difference, we do check. Is this something I need to be wary of? And it can often lead to division. You are different from me. It makes me feel a lot uneasy. So I will back off. We see this in communities, people pulling away your difference. So I'm just going to keep that gap. When that gap comes, that division, that separation, you then have the opportunities for misunderstanding. People aren't talking, they're not communicating well, they don't know each other, relationships are strained. And this is why the place of arguments happen, protests, riots, fights, these sort of things. Now we have to manage that. We have to manage those things. In Northern Ireland, the police, the army were there to manage the conflict. However, if we want longer term change, we need to transform the conflict. We need to help people cope with that difference so that it enriches our communities and enriches our lives rather than taking us down that, that uh, oh, up the tree. <laughs> uh, Brendan was trying to explain this. And I see this in churches as well. Even if we are in a church which in many ways may be monocultural, there is still huge diversity because we are all different. And we bring our sense of self into the church. The number of times you hear people saying, this is my church, or at my church we do this, and at my church we do that. And uh, there's that sense of ownership that people have. So when people come in, be they just, well, not just, they're members of the, the, the parish or the congregation, or whether they come in to a position of leadership, bringing difference, it can start to feel uncomfortable. And when we feel uncomfortable, <laughs> there's something we want to go back to feeling comfortable. <laughs> we want to try and revert sometimes. So um, 
I think uh, some of you will have experienced or uh, received some training from Liz Griffiths in 2020 um, and um, she from Bridge Builders but I think it was online is that right you did it uh, on Zoom um, how many could you do anyone remember doing that one <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I could just have repeated her training then, because um, it's good training. Um, she she uh, gave and uh, did some work on transition, handling transition and change. Uh, there are some really good handouts. I thought you already had them, so I haven't uh, printed them off for you. Um, maybe that be something that you could redistribute. I have actually yeah. asked. We've got the video of it. Which oh, right, okay. Yeah, so um, Liz did some quite re really helpful work on change and transition. And uh, so I'm, I'm not repeating that <laughs> today, but I was going to allude to it. So um, yeah, those, uh, there are some handouts and I have asked Liz whether I could uh, redirect you to them and she's very happy for that to happen. So maybe those handouts could, could go out again to, to people. So uh, what I'd like us to spend a little bit of time thinking about where conflict, why conflict happens. These are generic causes of conflict. Uh, we have conflict because of resources. There may be resources. Uh, if you think back for how you experienced conflict as a child, what sort of things did you argue about as a child? Fairness. Fairness. It's not fair. It's not fair. Whether, you know, my brother always disappeared to the loo just after a meal and never helped with any of the clearing up. And then he re-emerged when it was all done. It's not fair. What else did you argue about as a child? Having to share. Having to share. Toys, clothes, room, taking it in turns. Who gets to sit in the front seat of the car? It wasn't an argument over the remote control when I was a child because we only had one television and you had to get up and bang it on the top to make it change channels, not click it. Um, but yeah, those sort of whose turn, sharing, taking... Uh, the resources might be scarce, the number of Lego bricks or the, uh, the bike, whose turn was it to have? The relationships, who's my best friend? Who am I talking to? I'm not talking to you anymore. Those sort of arguments that we had as children, the structures that maybe make it feel it's not fair. Do I have to go to bed at this time? Everybody else goes to bed much later than I do. Um, interests and needs. I want, I want to watch this. I want to do that. <coughs> Information. You're not telling me. You're hiding things from me. I didn't know. Values and beliefs. What I, what I, what matters to me, whether it's a football team or I don't know, a pop star that you might have had a poster on your bedroom wall and if someone comes in and says, oh, that's rubbish. <gasps> you called David Cassidy rubbish? <laughs> Actually, I didn't like David Cassidy. I was a Jackson 5, but, you know, um, that's the, it, it goes deep. So the sorts of things we might have argued about as children are on this side. Toys, favoritism, friends, bedtime, rules, staying out late, do as you're told, football. On the other side are the sorts of things that you might argue about in adulthood in the church. And there will be more. <laughs> uh, land, power, rotors, sex. I don't mean rotors and sex, but uh, canon law, money, all the isms that are around gossip, theology. And football, <laughs> it's amazing. Football can be a cause of conflict in adulthood as well as in childhood and even in the church. And there are other things. We are going to meet conflict because we always have 
resources that may be limited. Who has access to the church hall on Monday nights? There is one church hall. There are three groups that want to use it. There will be structures, laws, that great, that are inconveniences that people feel and want to rail against. But probably the deepest ones are the values and beliefs. Just like football, it goes deep. And church is particularly vulnerable. Church life is particularly vulnerable because this isn't just hobby stuff that people are coming along to. This goes deep. This is who they are. Their relationship with God, their relationship with the church gets <laughs> completely morphed <laughs> on some occasions. So your work, my work, is actually a minefield. And I would love to have road signs to navigate. Road signs are there to keep us safe on the roads so that we move, the traffic keeps moving, we get to our destinations safely. I would love to have road signs in the church and uh, in our communities to navigate those sort of things. Unfortunately, we don't have them. But we do have conflict. And in every conflict, there are three Ps. The who of people, the who of conflict. The second P is problem, the what of conflict. And the third P is process, the how of conflict. People, problem, process. There are people in every conflict, unless it's in the jungles when it's animals, but what I'm talking, you know, there are people who have this conflict. There will be a problem, the what they are arguing, what the people are arguing about. And generally we tend to focus on those two Ps, what and who. We don't give enough time to the how, the process. So that's what we're going to be doing today, thinking about the how. And some of this will be common sense to all of you. <laughs> and you'll be saying, she's teaching her grandmother to suck eggs. Although that's a stupid expression. <laughs> My grandmother never sucked eggs. And I wouldn't have wanted to teach her anyway. Um, but uh, it's, and you're also not my grandmother's. <laughs> um, but it's that area of how that we often think we're good at and we get into patterns of behaving and acting ourselves that maybe we just need to look at and re-examine sometimes and learn from each other as to how others work in these situations. There is huge experience in this room. You have been dealing with conflict for years and that's a learned experience that you need to be sharing. So I'm going to share some of my learned experience of conflict. And this is the first one. Conflict is a natural and inevitable part of life. It happens to us all. If I say the word conflict, what comes into your mind? What words come into your mind when I say conflict? Fight. Argument. Argument. Hassle. Hassle. Disagreement. Disagreement. Fear. 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 Hurt. Frustration. Frustration. What do we notice about all those words? Negative. They're very negative. Conflict is going to happen. And it's going to be bad? <laughs> wow, that's pretty depressing, isn't it? It's going to happen and it's going to be horrible. No, it doesn't have to be. I'd like to offer a different definition of conflict. It comes from Chinese. It comes from, uh, they don't have one word for conflict. They have two um, 
characters, that's the word, isn't it? Two characters for conflict. They put together the character for crisis and for danger together with the character for opportunity. And I think that's something quite creative because it doesn't diminish the danger of conflict. Any of you who have been involved in serious conflict, you will know that it is a hurtful, damaging, dangerous place to be. And we only have to look at what's going on in Ukraine. That's conflict. It can be that crisis danger, but it can also create opportunity. Can you think of any opportunities that conflict has created in our history? equal opportunities. Our suffragettes and suffragists who at the beginning of uh, the nine, uh, 20th century who were chaining themselves to rain, railings and being very conflictual in what they did brought about change, greater opportunities, particularly for women getting us the vote. Civil rights movements, anti-apartheid movements, Conflict can bring life and change. It can bring that opportunity. We take the root word conflict, and I'm sure there are Latin scholars in the room, and so please don't tell me that this is not uh, correct. I know it's not correct after I've done the slide. It's actually confligere, apparently, not confligare. I shouldn't have told you that because you probably didn't know. Uh, to spark or to ignite. Um, neither positive nor negative. To spark or to ignite. <coughs> so taking that on to the image of fire, we can hold in our heads different images of fire. Fire. I don't know what comes into your mind when you hear the word fire. Probably depends how I say it. So if I shout it, fire! One image will come into your mind. I won't shout it because in case anyone <laughs> thinks the building is on fire. But, you know, that's fire. That's fire out of control. That's fire that's damaging, dangerous, destructive, and leads to death. That's fire. That's uh, fire near to where I lived in Burnley for a while. And the fire that causes loss, loss of possession, loss of identity. Your things are, are destroyed. But that's fire. That woman creates the most amazing candlesticks using wrought iron. She could not make them. She could not be creative without fire. And then if my husband says to me on a Saturday night, can we have a fire tonight? He's not talking house fire. He's talking that sort of fire. We need to do the same with conflict. Out of control... Conflict can be as destructive and as dangerous as the forest fire. But it can also be a tool that can be harnessed and used. It gets back to that process word. How do we work with conflict? So there were those uh, two images that I had of, that's Rosa Parks, uh, who uh, sat on the bus and refused to move uh, in, uh, where was it, Alabama? Alabama. And uh, the suffragettes. So, conflict is a natural and inevitable part of life. It happens to us all. Conflict in itself is not negative. It can bring growth. It can bring learning. It can bring change. However, if handled inappropriately, conflict can be destructive. And when it is, it creates fear. <coughs> and when we're fearful of something, 
we back away <coughs> rather than walk towards. So in a way, conflict's its own worst enemy <laughs> because it causes hurt and pain. So we fear it, so we back off and then we don't build and work at it and then it causes hurt and pain and so on. So, are you all with me? I'm sorry, I'm talking rather a lot. Uh, you will get a lot more time to talk, honest. Uh, I'm going to just offer you one little bit more and then I'm going to ask you to, 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 to talk in, in round your tables. I want you to imagine uh, that there is a specific problem or issue. So, this is an imaginary situation, okay? Have we got that? It's imaginary. It didn't happen. I want you to imagine that I spent a whole day cleaning the bathroom. That certainly didn't happen, all right? Uh, a whole day cleaning the bathroom. I, it was gleaming by the end of it. Next morning, I go into the bathroom and there's toothpaste all over the hand basin. There's towel just dropped. I say? Do I say, oh look, there's toothpaste around the hand basin. I'll have to clear that up. Or do I say, you have left toothpaste around the hand basin. Oh, why can't you just clear up after yourself? <clears throat> and my dearly beloved, because he's the only other one in the house at the moment, uh, feels got at. So that personal antagonism that has happened, that other person is seen as the problem. You have done that. You are inconsiderate. You never clear up. Charges are made. And when that happens, Andy gets defensive. And so he has a go back. Well, you're not so perfect. That towel on the floor, that wasn't me, that was you. And when did you last empty the dishwasher? When did you last do the bins? And of course then I get defensive. What do you mean when did I do the bins? When did I wash up? We, we have to do arrangement. I cook, you clear up. Whoever cooks doesn't clear up. They're, don't have a go at me about that. We get this push and this push back. The defensiveness in one person triggers defensiveness in the other. And we start to expand the issues. Issues are added. You never empty the bins. You never empty the dishwasher. I always have to do that. Notice the language. Language is less specific. You always, you never, the minister never visits. You always, everybody says, some people feel. And I start feeling really uncomfortable. So, instead of talking to Andy, Diane over there, I met her as I came in, lovely lady. Nice to meet you, Diane. Thank you. Can I talk to you about Andy? He's doing my head in. Don't <laughs> That wasn't the answer. You're supposed to say, yes, Joe. And, you know, I go off and talk to my friends. He goes off and he talks to his friends. He goes and says, oh, Joe, she's doing my head in. Nag, nag, nag. <coughs> we start talking about rather than talking to. The emotional element increases. He doesn't understand. He doesn't care. She doesn't value what I do. Our actual understanding goes down. 
and what we build in our heads is our own kind of case, our own viewpoint. And because Diane's such a lovely person and she, she does that positive stroking and says, oh yes, I know, it must be so hard for you. I don't really want to get involved, uh, but you know, it must be really hard. I start looking at everything he does. He's out a bit longer than he should have been, or he didn't, wasn't there, and he, he didn't. He always needs to make me a cup of tea in the morning, but he hasn't made me a cup of tea for a long time now. Is that because he doesn't care? And, what, what? and we start assuming things. We start insulting each other. We get more and more entrenched in our position, our viewpoint of the other. until we get to that pace of polarization. The original problem has been forgotten. I've gone home to my mum. She only lives down the road. Why? Because of toothpaste on a hand basin? No. Now it's so much more. New hurts have been added. Our friends have divided into camps. I've got my side. He's got his side. Our relationships are in tatters. There's entrenched polarization and no backing down. Now I said that's imaginary. It is imaginary for me. I never clean the bathroom. No. Um, uh, but it's not imaginary for lots of people, and that's not because they're bad people, and there may be people in this room. Uh, that, that dynamic has happened because it happens to us all. It hasn't happened to me and Andy about toothpaste and things, but it has happened to me and Andy in different ways over the other things and in other groups and with other people. It happens to us all. That's a natural dynamic to conflict. It takes on a life. <coughs> and this is where its destructiveness come, come in. Something happens and almost as quickly as that, we see the other person as the problem. Some people used, used to say, well, or have said to me, Joe, the other person is the problem. It's a personality clash, or they're just difficult people. It's the person who's the problem. Yes, but that person wouldn't have appeared to be a problem if they hadn't said or done something that indicated that at some point. Where do you intervene on this? Really hard. You can't do it at the beginning because you don't know that it's happened until quite further down. So I'm going to stop. Oh, no, I'm not going to stop talking. I'll come to one last thing and then I'm going to stop talking. That dynamic happens in church life. And uh, a American psych uh, consultant um, uh, decided to try to create levels of church conflict. I've got these on a handout for you because I think this is really quite helpful and important and I would love to spend the rest of the day looking at these levels of church conflict. I haven't got the time. So take them away, read about them and uh, yeah. He decided if, if that he was going to take that dynamic of conflict and create a kind of ladder and he's taken it uh, in a kind of yeah, starting at the bottom, going up. Every church, every Christian community will have problems to solve. That is all what we call level one conflict. Problems to solve. We all have them. However, sometimes it turns into that area of disagreement, which is that level two conflict, where things become a little bit more cautious, people start holding back some information, they're not comfortable with others, there's not the open sharing. Problem solving, 
yeah, we can get on, we can communicate, we can work well at this, we can come to... When it gets to disagreement, things are getting a little bit more. If that is allowed to escalate, it will move to up to contest. This is when, in a way, the battle lines are much more clearly defined. Uh, it's clear there is conflict that is at that contest level. And people have now started moving into more of a win-lose type dynamic. We want to win. If I get called into a church and I work out that they are at contest level, I'm delighted <laughs> because I can do so you can do something at that level. You can work there. There is energy. It matters to people. This is a church that is that is focused and wants to. Yeah, there's life there. <laughs> However, it's not far from level three conflict to level four, fight or flight. And this is where people are really in it to win and to get rid of the other. If they leave, or they can't stand it any longer, so they leave. Fight or flight is really hard to work in because by the time you get to that level, it has become really entrenched. And people are positioning so hard that as if their life almost depends on it. And this is a sort of level where we get more church splits. However, there is what we call level five conflict, and that is holy war. This is the horrendous situations that some of you may have experienced. And if you have, there's very little that can be done in terms of rectifying it. You need consultants, people to come in to offer the care, to offer something to try and hold the people, the collateral damage. You can't solve that conflict, but you can try and make sure that new life can come. This is the forest fire out of control. Sorry to be cheery. Um, it is an escalating. And this is why the work that I do, I passionately believe in. Because conflict is going to happen. And it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be fight or flight or holy war. But if it's left unchecked, if it's left, if we're so frightened of it that we back off and don't walk towards it, then it can be so. Okay, I'll come back to that later. Get that. Uh, I've talked at you far too long. Let me pass these round. We're moving in five minutes. Yes, five minutes. We've got a coffee break. What I'd like to do, if I can, there's probably not enough on there. I've, uh, um, what I would like you to do, if you can, in your groups for a few minutes. When have you seen uh, these kind of escalations happen? When, what have I said in this bit so far that you kind of resonates with you? It may be in your own families, it may be in your communities that you've seen that escalation happen. Where have you seen conflict that has actually led to opportunity and growth and healing uh, and greater understanding? 
where have you seen it lead to destruction? And if you've got, to, you, you may want to look at the levels of conflict and just uh, flick through those. Uh, you may not want to, you won't want to look at them later. So just for five minutes, I'd like you to take what we've been talking, what I've been talking about, and share, when have you seen this? What makes sense? What connects with your experience? Yes, you, have I been clear enough in my waffle there about what you're discussing? Yeah? Please remember that there may be quite deep hurts for some people that they're carrying because of the way a church may have treated them in the past. So as you, as you share and listen to each other's experience, do, do remember that we carry, we come as whole people, not just a role. Uh, this uh, little cartoon is up as a description of how so often we forget to see different perspectives. Uh, we know that... Uh, am I in the way of the screen? If I move back a bit here, is that better? Yeah. Well, now that... I'm, I don't mind if I'm off for... <laughs> <laughs> Um, is it a six or is it a nine? Well, if you're at that side, you'll think it's a nine. If you're this side, think it's a six. Is it a six? Or is it a nine? Or is it a G? We can get so convinced that we know. And this is a, a way of thinking about how people take positions. They assume, they make their standpoint on what they think a, a, th a thing should be uh, or how we should act or what we should do. That's the way. That's that priority signal <laughs> that someone was talking about earlier. And then they can get locked into the positions and it becomes almost a battle of wills. Uh, the where, you know, the strongest will out. I actually quite like this picture because yes, it's the stags and they're locked horns and all that. But I don't know if you can see, it's not, at least you can see on this one, their eyes are just kind of looking at each other <laughs> out the top, you know, kind of like keeping an eye on each other there. They're, they're as near to eyeing each other as they can. Uh, it looks like they're looking down, but actually on there, but it, they are looking out the top of their eyes. We take positions in conflict, positions that others see. It's a bit like the iceberg as you go along. That You see that iceberg. If you were bobbing along in the water, <laughs> you would see that. I want, oh, I was going to say, I want to imagine. But I don't have to imagine. For once I've remembered to bring one, I usually forget to bring it. I have an orange. Well, it's a tangerine, but it'll do. An orange. Who can I pick on? Whose name do I know? Toby, I know your name. You want the orange. You want the whole orange. And you want it now. <laughs> okay. You want the orange, you want the whole orange, and you want it now. Someone else whose name, uh, Sally, you want the orange, you want the whole orange, and you want it now. Ladies and gentlemen, I have one orange. What do I do? Just give it to me. Just give it to you. I give it to Tim. <laughs> But Toby's sitting there going, no, excuse me, I want the orange. And Sally says, but I want the orange. What do I do? I'm not going to give it to Tim. You can peel it and say, and give us half each. I could peel it and give it half each. 
You've forgotten your script, haven't you? <laughs> I want the orange. I want the whole orange. So, you know, Sally wants the whole orange and you want the whole orange. So giving you half an orange? No, Sally's shaking her head. That won't do. What do I do, ladies and gentlemen? You make the decision based on who you think deserves it. I make the decision based on who I think deserves it. Well, that's, yeah, I could do that. Toby, you gave me a really good answer to the road signs. Yeah, so that was, I love that. Oh, yes, that chippings. That are you deserve. But then, Sally, I had a really good conversation with you the other day. It's like, oh, they both deserve it. Give it to no one. Give it to no one. But I'm a nice person. I want, I don't want it. So, and I want to give the, I'm a nice person. I'll put you and get another one. Yeah, well, this, I could go and get, but there are no other oranges in the whole of Rotherham, and they want it now. Put it on the floor and let them fight it out. I could let them fight it out. Okay. <laughs> Make something new with it, they both might like. Make something new with it that they both might like. So, yeah, but I haven't got time. I've got to deliver a training. I can't make something new with an orange that they might, both might like. <laughs> Eat it myself? Bless you. And then put them both together in the same room and get them to explain it to themselves. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I go to Toby. I go to Toby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit like Solomon, yeah. Um, I go to Toby and I say, Toby, help me to understand why you want the orange, why you want the whole orange, and why you want it now. And Toby says, don't worry, I'll tell you why. Uh, and Toby says, well, you know, I'm, I'm on a bit of a health kick at the moment, and I'm, you know, got some important things coming up. I can't afford to be ill, so I'm taking regular doses of vitamin C, and I need... The, the, the pulp, the flesh uh, of a whole orange. I'm having one in the morning, one in the evening, and I haven't had it today yet. So I come to Sally and I say, Sally, help me to understand why it is you want the whole orange and you want it now. And you say, well, I happen to know that it's Denise's birthday and she loves the orange cake that I make and I need for the recipe the zest and rind of a whole orange. And I need to do it now because, you know, she's here and it's her birthday now. I need to get it in the oven. So, I could give you the zest and the rind, and then you could have the flesh and the juice. You both get what you need because we asked that question, why? Why is it? In other words, we're going the positions I want, you should. We know, I like the top of the iceberg. We know icebergs are so much bigger underneath. It's this bottom bit that we need to get to when people are positioning. When people start saying, you must have, I don't know, an evening service at, even song at 6.30, you must do this, we need, you should, What's the deeper interest and need that's below it? The top is the label, the behavior, the, the, the position. Underneath are the deeper needs, desires, concerns, experiences, assumption, identity, beliefs, and values. When we're dealing with positions at the top, it's, there can almost be a gulf between them. When we go below the waterline, it's like two icebergs, when we go below the waterline to the deeper interests and needs, you never know, there might be that creative common ground. Now, going below the waterline, digging beneath the positions, the standpoints, the, the, the one direction type, uh, road sign. This is the way we do it here. 
the positions. Digging beneath is not a guaranteed solve all, but it makes it more likely. So let's imagine that Sally did need the pulp the, as well for, for some reason. Now she's heard why Toby needs it. He's concerned about his health. He's got this big thing coming up that he's got to be well for, and that's obviously important to him. And she says, oh, don't worry, I'll make Denise a coffee cake. Or Toby hears that it's, oh, that's a lovely ringtone, sorry. Um, uh, Toby hears that uh, it's Denise's birthday, and he thinks, yeah, absolutely, not to worry, I've got, I'll just take a tablet for once, it won't hurt. Because they now understand the motives of the other person, which they weren't getting with the, I want the orange, I want the whole orange, and I want it now. So examples of position statements that have been offered to me, you must move your car, I want to park here. I hate this church, I don't like coming here. These are position statements I've heard people say. But actually, the interest that was below them, my mother finds walking difficult, so I need to park near the door. My eyesight isn't good, so I struggle with steps. I feel worried about coming here. Instead of, I hate this church. I don't want to come. Okay. It's oversimplistic. It's not a magic wand. But when people are positioning, my number one advice to you is when you hear that and recognize that positioning, dig beneath. Find out what's going on beneath. Ignoring the demands. Focus on the underlying interests because there will be fear, there will be loneliness, there will be anxiety, there will be all sorts of things which are leading to people taking the stance that they are. These difficult, awkward customers <laughs> that can even be in your own families sometimes. They have deeper interests and needs that are leading to that behavior. It doesn't make the behaviors right, but if you just deal at behavior level, you're at the conflict management level, to transform the situation, you have to dig beneath. It doesn't automatic solve it. So we're not going to do that for the moment. We're coming on to this. Why does it happen in churches? This is whatever, what I've said to you up till now could happen anywhere, any group, really, uh, communities. Why particularly in churches? So a question to you. Why? Uh, a friend of mine has just completed his doctorate on churches are more vulnerable to destructive conflict than any other community organization. <laughs> I won't tell you what his conclusion was. But that was his, that was the kind of thing he was exploring. Why are churches vulnerable to destructive conflict? We're supposed to love and welcome everyone. And that includes some yeah. interesting personalities. Absolutely. If the church is genuinely inclusive, if we say, you are welcome here, God's love is for everyone. They come and they bring their baggage with them. They also bring the, their quirks and their oddities. We've all got quirks and oddities and ours are okay. But it's when other people bring theirs, that's when it becomes more of a problem. Unrealistic expectations. Lovely, I think it's even on my list. We really think we are unrealistic. It's like I said at the beginning, you know, we don't, we don't like conflict, so yeah. and we shouldn't because we're lucky. Love yeah. So then we don't deal with it when it happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. That sense of we love each other. We love each other. And because we love each other, how do I tell you I think you're wrong? 
Or how do, so we have those unrealistic expectations. <coughs> how do we have the conversations? We, we haven't necessarily skilled at our churches to have them, and people in our churches to have them. And so they very often resort to what used to happen again at childhood. You know, when you fought in, with your brother or sister, very often it went on until a parent or a teacher weighed in and said, right, you go to your room, you go to your room, this is what's going to happen. And then shake hands, make up. And in a way, some people in our churches are still looking at us as ministers to sort it out. You sort this out. This is going on, Vicar. You sort it. Churches are full of lovely people who love each other. Surely it doesn't happen here. Yes, it does. Other reasons? Oh. 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 Yeah. We don't, we don't, we like the, uh, we like the absolutes. And I think, I think there is a, personally, I think that whilst society and world is changing so much and there is so much insecurity, people look to the church to be static. Is that the right? I don't know, but uh, they don't want surprise. They don't want change. They don't want ambiguity or questions or wonderings, which actually I think is what the church should be about, questioning and wondering, but there we go. They, they like the absolute, the definite, and that's fine until someone's definite and absolute conflicts with someone else's. <coughs> Thank you. Well, we're an institution and we have certain practices that enable people to um, sort of take over power, if you see what I mean, and use their power. So like PCCs, some people are drawn to PCCs because they love the idea of, of having that power. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so often we, in churches, we're so desperate, well, maybe it's just Baptist churches, we're so desperate to have people take on roles. And so we say, would someone please take this on? We need this to happen. And someone who perhaps in work has not been able to take a position for all sorts of perhaps right reasons, volunteers, and we go, great, thank you, Myrtle, for taking this on. And actually, Myrtle is not the right person for it. Uh, and sometimes it can be that I don't have any control at work, or I don't have any role at work, or in the home or in the family. Here, I've suddenly got, I'm wanted, I'm needed, and power can go to people's heads. And it can almost, I can't let go of it now because if I let go of it, it's all, it's a denial of me. Mm. And you don't have control over Merkel in the way that Merkel is controlled for work. Yes, yeah. And works often have the structures when people get out of kilter or behave in ways that are, you know, there will be very often, not always, but there often are kind of behavioural policies and things which kind of just in church, yes, we do have them, but we don't like to talk about them and it suddenly seems really severe if we do and, and it's major. We're escalating it if we take it to a, an official level. So we back off. Other reason? Just on that last point, in the church in England, we don't have those no. processes. Yeah. We don't have membership, so no, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, thank you. Uh, Sibylla? And then people leave because murder is a pain in the butt. You don't yeah. follow them up, so they may never even know what is going Yes, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody stops coming. And we think, oh, it's such a shame. We've not seen them for a long time. I wonder what's going on for them. Perhaps they've got, perhaps they've moved away. Perhaps there's pressures at work. Perhaps they're not well. Do we say, perhaps they can't stand Myrtle? You know? Well, 
for equally, the minute it begins a campaign to convince everyone how she would be so wrong, yeah. because the vicar or whoever it is, the PCC, have tried to Absolutely. prevent this behaviour, and the vicar and the PCC feel that they can't go around uh, gossiping yeah. about Myrtle. That's right. So what Myrtle says is what's on the platform and everybody That's is right, there. because Myrtle is the one that's speaking. Poor Myrtle. <laughs> no, one, no one here is called Myrtle, are they? <laughs> um, but yeah, that sense of there come, became, then the cliques come and the gossip shots come and who's being listened to and who's saying what and that misinformation, uh, that just escalates. Um, we're broken people, but we don't really like admitting it. We're broken people. We're broken people. And we don't like admitting it. I think, yeah, absolutely. We mentioned family times, which is the other place where conflicts yes. are most common, and perhaps that's because belonging and identity are connected with both family yeah. and church. Yeah, yeah. And churches are full of families. And some of those conflicts that are happening in the family spill out into the church community. Um, just a tragic situation that I've been dealing with with the church, not in Sheffield, not even in Yorkshire. Um, uh, 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 and not an Anglican church, not a Baptist church either. Um, uh, <laughs> for one church in uh, um, where the whole church has been divided because of, of a marital breakdown. Two members of their they had a worship group who led worship on the stage, and it was a, like a soap opera. People were coming to church almost to to observe the behaviour between this couple and another couple that got dragged into it and an affair and all sorts of things and the church broke because of it. So, the, uh, but also we talk about the church as a family and in any family you will, also, you will have the toddlers throwing their tantrums and you will have the truculent teenagers. I've seen some fantastic octogenarians who are basically being stroppy teenagers. Uh, you know, we play the roles. We play the, we have somebody who takes the parenting role in a church and it's not always the vicar uh, or the, uh, the church leadership. So these roles get a family get paid out because it becomes our identity. It's the identity we hold in our family. We take that identity into the church family. Sometimes the conflict is because there are rights and wrongs. Yeah. And I'm not thinking necessarily of immediate questions about ethics, for instance. Yeah. But I've been in two church splits and one collapsed. Yeah. Um, the one that collapsed was 9 o'clock service. So mm. that was headline news all over the country. Mm. But before that, I've been to other churches that have just divided. Mm. And I think in both cases, it was probably to do or possibly in one case to do with the leadership, yeah. and in the second case, definitely to do, to do with the leadership. The leadership. <coughs> um, yeah, mm. uh, so mm. I mean, and we're reading in terms of times at the moment about other yeah. situations and where there are clear rights and rights. Absolutely, there will be situations of. Yeah, right and wrong behaviour and attitudes and that actually need to be challenged. And it comes back to that how, how we deal with this, the people problem process. How are we working in those situations in a way that ultimately is not destructive? Right, so um, it does happen and we could go on. There are lots of reasons why churches happen. Right, I'm going to put something up. And you've got 15 seconds to look at it. Not the best image. Okay. What did you see? Starfish. Starfish. Pizza cutter. Pizza cutter. Oh. Magnifying glass. Spirit level. Heart. Object. 
Spirit level. Tape measure. Tape measure. Mobile phone. Mobile phone. Ball of wool. Shoe. Shoe. Little shoe. Cotton bud. Cotton bud. What's that? <laughs> oh, I don't think there was. Ruler. Ruler. Camera. Camera. <laughs> okay. It's not the clearest picture. How many people saw all of the things that have just been said? No. It was a mess. It wasn't clear. But we will all have seen different things. It's the same, you all looked at the same picture, but you will have seen different things. People sat over there who are further away, possibly didn't have as good a view as people who were nearer. Again, this is an exercise I do with lots of people. The glasses that are here are really hard to see. You saw the spirit level. You might look through them. Why do we remember some things? Why do we notice some things, not notice others? They're bigger. Some things are bigger. So the bigger things can often take our attention. The colourful things take our attention. For example, the heart. Quite a few of you will have seen and noticed the heart. The colour is things stand out. Something's interest us or resonate with us. Yeah, if there's something that resonates with us, that you connect with, you understand. It's more organic that connects Yeah, yeah, that's kind of that organic connection. So why, what, what, what is this leading us to, to remember about church life and conflict? And what's the connections? Sorry? We all see things differently. We all see things. Where, where our interests are. For some, it's like quite liturgical. Yeah. For other people, they don't want them to do the one singing. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it all depends where we... we yeah. Are. So where we're we coming from, uh, at what we, we see things differently, have, we have different preferences in that way. We notice different things that connect to us. We often like those things that, we, that make us feel connected. There are things there that you didn't recognise, you didn't understand, and so you glossed over them. I can't work out what that is, so I'll just miss that one. I'll move on and look at something else. And, you know, if there are things that we don't like or we don't, or let's just ignore that for the time being. But unfortunately, and there are also things that are hidden, not easy to see. And again, in conflict, very often we go with the obvious. When it, it's Myrtle standing up and speaking, we go to Myrtle and we send all our attention on Myrtle, trying to sort Myrtle. But actually, it's Quentin. <laughs> Quentin's been doing the stirring. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not Myrtle. <laughs> All right, so we're now going to have some conflict in the room. Great. I wasn't expecting that from over Simon's. Quentin's not a man. <laughs> This is bad. All right, well, I could go there, really. I haven't got time. Why are you such a good group? Um, causes of church. We've said all these things. These are the sorts of things that cause conflict in churches. So, well, we've done that. Done that. Oh, that's not going to come. No. Can't show you that. I'll try and see if I can show it later. Very quickly, I want to tell you about three churches. We have River Crossings Baptist Church. They're going to be Baptist churches because I thought Anglican churches are probably... Um, we could have St Stephen the Stormy, how about that? St Stephen the Stormy or a, a River Crossings Baptist Church. Oh. Uh, Lake Placid Baptist Church, Rift Valley Baptist Church. So River Crossings Baptist Church, let's tell you about this one. Um, they've got eight key 
members or families. And they're trying to decide whether to have a music group or to keep the choir. A, B, C and D would like a music group. We need to be move with the times. But E, F, G and H want the choir. We've had a choir for years and it's fabulous. We need to have the choir. They're also discussing the subject of pews and chairs. And uh, A, B, G and H, I think, yes, would like to keep the pews. The pews are great. They give that air of reverence. But C, D, E, and F say, no, let's get some chairs, and then we can move things around. We can have greater um, flexibility, that's the word. They're also discussing where to have tea and coffee after church. And H, A, E, and D say, we need to have it in the community room, in the hall. It's great, the children can run around their space. But G, B, C, and F say, no, let's have it in the church sanctuary because that's where people are and you can get them before they disappear. And uh, they're also deciding who to call or who they're, you know, what sort of person they want as their next oversight minister. Let's put it like that. Uh, and G, H, D, and C say, we need the person, we need the man that God is calling to us. <laughs> and A, B, F, and E say, no, we need the person that God is calling. River Crossings Baptist Church, we get the Baptist bit. You could go and be the Overside Minister of St. Stephen the Stormy. Okay? Or you already are, right? Or, but before you rush there, let me tell you about Rift Valley Baptist Church. Rift Valley Baptist Church also has eight key people or families. A, B, C and D would very much like to have a music group. They think they must move with times. They get the drums out and fabulous. E, G, F and E say no. The choir all the time. The Latin anthem they sang on Sunday was beautiful. They're also talking about pews and chairs. A, B, C and D say we need to get rid of the pews. We need to be able to have liturgical dance and drama and we need that flexibility. Whereas H, G, F and E say no, we need the pews. You can put your handbag on one side, your hymn book on the other, and no one comes close. <laughs> <laughs> then you can imagine they're also discussing tea and coffee after worship. A, B, C, and D say, we need to be in the church, and then the children can crawl underneath the pews. Oh, the pews aren't there. They can run around the chairs. Uh, and H, G, F, and E say, no, you'll get crumbs. You'll get spillages. We can't have that in the church. So they are saying, we need to have it in the other room. They're also discussing the subject of who to call as their next minister. And remember, in Baptist churches, they get to choose. Um, well, not choose, discern. Um, uh, a, B, C, and D say, we need the person. H, G, F, and E say, we need the man. But before you rush to Rift Valley, there's one more. There's Lake Placid Baptist Church, who also have eight key members. And they are also discussing pews and chairs. But they don't want to upset. So we won't deal with it now. But one of them feels they can't come anymore because they can't sit in the pew, because it's too painful. So A stops coming. They're also discussing whether to have a music group. And E, because they're not wanting to embrace new music, thinks I'll go elsewhere. 
But G, who is the choir leader, also feels undervalued because no one's standing up for the choir. And so G stops coming as well. They're also talking about tea and coffee, but that's just too fraught, so they just won't have it. <laughs> and the ch church becomes... Well, it's not going anywhere, is it? So, Rift Valley, Lake Placid, River Crossings. Which one are you going to go to? First one, river crossings. Why? We don't have a single division. That's we don't right. Have two yeah. Two single parties. Yeah. We've got multiple groups and multiple. Yeah. So there's disagreement, but it's disagreement about issues. It's not become personalised. Rift Valley is now, I wouldn't mind betting that in Rift Valley there are some people who are on the kind of pews and chairs side who would actually quite like to have, on the pews side, who quite like to have chairs. But now almost to say, I want chairs, is almost like letting the side down, almost kind of like going to the, the other side, the happy clappy lot, the dark side. The dark side. And, and now, okay, that's generalised and it's contrived. But the thing that river crossings, there will be these decisions and disagreements that happen in churches. That's what the life of the church is about. It's movement, it's change, it's, you know, it's new structures like oversight ministry, you know? And it happens. And there will be lots of different opinions. And that's okay, because actually, that intermesh, the mess, actually binds it together. If one of those relationships breaks, there are others that keep the connection. If the Rift Valley one, if there's a relationship there that breaks, then you're in trouble. We can be divided by conflict, but conflict can also bind us together. Okay. So, that's where I wanted to get to by coffee. <laughs> so I was running behind. What I want to spend a little bit of time before we come to our next break, 20 minutes, yes, I can do this in 20 minutes, um, is to think about ourselves. How do we manage ourselves? If there's all this potential for destructive conflict in the churches that we're a part of, how do we manage ourselves? What does it do to us as individuals? How do we manage conflict? And one key important part is how we communicate. And so I want just to name this graph because how we communicate when we are in conflict is crucial to how we manage it. This graph, it's not clear, I'm sorry, I, don't think the focus is helping. But two axes to this graph. Uh, the vertical axis there is the ability to communicate. And the horizontal axis is the intensity of feelings. And what we find is that when people are not really bothered about something, they don't really get that, you know, the level of communication is pretty low. They're not fired up about it, they didn't talk about it. As they become more interested, the level of communication rises to what we call the optimal level of communication. And their ability to communicate is high. But as feelings get more and more intense, our ability to communicate drops down. It happens to us all. For some people, it leads to you speaking more quickly, more emphatically, louder. Some people get angry. If they're, well, they're angry, that anger comes out in the way they speak. It becomes abrupt. Some people employ bad language. Some people, as those feelings, 
grow actually go quieter. Their ability to communicate drops down. Just because somebody might be speaking a lot and loudly doesn't mean they're actually communicating well. Equally, when people go quieter, they're not communicating well. You'll have discovered I don't have a problem talking. Um, except when I'm in conflict with my daughter, my wonderful, wonderful daughter, who, by the way, is bringing a play, her, she's an actor, she's bringing her play to Sheffield, and I don't want to go today without telling you about this play, because it's wonderful, and it's coming very soon, and it's just wonderful. But that's, I'll tell you later. Um, when Alice and I get into conflict, which doesn't happen very often now, she's 30, uh, but when she was 16, we really had some. And I would get to the point that I couldn't speak. I couldn't get my words out. I get tight across my chest. I feel sick and I can't communicate. When you get into conflict, when your feelings get so intense, it affects the way we communicate. So we have, when we're in those conflict situations, to pay such close attention to how we're communicating, because that happens. And in that is the fight, flight, uh, stuff going on as well. And there's quite a lot on the handout that Liz gave to you or to the group last time uh, that, that covers that. So I'm not going to go uh, into that a lot. But uh, just be aware, this is reactive behaviour. And part of the way we can skill ourselves to deal with conflict is to control our reactivity. Because it is so easy, even when the conflict isn't about us, to get drawn into it. Or for people to see and read things into what we're saying and what we're doing, which we might not actually be trying to... Uh, might not be saying what they think we're saying, but it's just because we are saying it, they make that assumption. That level of optimal communication. When we pass it, we need to recognize it. So, how do we manage our anxiety? The sheet that Liz gave you is really good on this. Uh, now, so that's why I say uh, I think it'd be really helpful for you to have that handout. So it will come to you uh, from Bill. Uh, make sure these handouts come to you. And I would suggest you have a read of it. It covers what we call family systems theory. And family systems theory is a really helpful way of understanding how we manage anxiety in the system. The church is a system, and what we mean, uh, I, that's not a very clear picture, but it's a bit like a hanging mobile. It's like, you know, if, 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 a, if a gust of wind came and just caught, or if I knocked one of those little things, the whole thing would get set because it's all connected. And this is what we find in churches. When one part of the mobile gets really anxious, one part, one part of the church gets really anxious. It sends, uh, um, so if there's trauma or if there's a crisis or something happens, it goes through the system. You cannot stop that happening. What you can do is recognize that you are one of the hanging things. You are part of that. And so when the gusts come at you, when your anxiety comes, rather than your anxiety setting the whole thing, it's trying to calm yourself, manage your anxiety, manage your reactive behavior so that you don't set, you don't add to the storm. Does that make sense? I'm trying to summarize a course in family systems theory that takes about a week down to 10 minutes. So forgive me if this is not crystal clear. Anxiety 
is a key cause of conflict. Anxiety in a system can be acute, i.e. a crisis, the ceilings falling in, we have a decision to make about, or chronic, habitual, under the surface, therefore generations. Dealing with one church that has just had a church split and not just had a church split, 18 months ago had a church split. And when we worked with them, the actual nub of it happened 45 years ago. But it's just been a cyclical thing underneath the surface that has just never been resolved. Tension, fear, anger, toxic secrets, all those things generate anxiety in a system. And that creates symptoms. In other words, people's behavior. Some anger, some anxiety, is some, some anger is there or fear is there. That makes people anxious and they then behave in a particular way. The, and the behavior is what we call the symptom. And it's the symptoms that we then try to address. We try to deal with the person that's behaving badly. And what we often don't recognize is the systemic nature, the anxiety, the fear, the anger, the secrets that are there. We deal with the behavior, the presenting behavior. Often the system will resist dealing with its dysfunction, the habitual anxiety, and try to sort and address the. That should say, it's gone off the, uh, <laughs> uh, the symptom, okay? And we see it in families. And if I was doing family systems theory, I would be telling you now about my own family, my sister, my brother, my brother who has always been a, a problem in the family. And my parents' life has been directed to solving my brother, solving the problem. And my mother is 90, and she was in tears only a couple of nights ago about my brother who's 55 and uh, still lurching from crisis to crisis. Except he's not. Now he's got a fabulous life. But she can't see that. She is still in that place of, it, it's, it's, so, it's so deeply rooted. Anyway, I'm offering you this, not because I'm trying to teach you family systems theory in 10 minutes, but if you recognize in your churches, and I recognize that you do have sometimes more than one church that you have oversight or connection with, if you sense that there is systemic stuff, I would encourage you to have a look at family systems theory. Find someone, contact Bridge Builders, contact me, find someone who you can talk things through with. Because churches can be very good at seeing, oh, it's all Myrtle. We just need to solve Myrtle. And if that means getting rid of Myrtle, well then, that's sad to say, but bye-bye Myrtle. But actually, the fear, the anger, whatever has caused underneath the iceberg for Myrtle to do whatever she's doing, that doesn't go away. And I can almost guarantee that if you get rid of Myrtle, within six months, there'll be Myrtle too. <laughs> and you don't want to mess with Myrtle too. And we see it time and time again. If we just try to expel one person from a church, and I know you don't have <laughs> quite the same way as in your know, Baptist church's membership, but churches do have a way of getting rid of people. Uh, 
There's also the, the sort of person that will say, if you don't do what I want, I will walk. I will leave. Well, my advice if you get someone repeatedly saying that is, do you want a card or a pot plant? Okay? Bless you on your way. Don't want you to go, but if you feel that's the right thing for you to do, bless you. Can I help you find another church which will be the right place for you? Because there are some people, unfortunately, who will try to bully you. And dealing with conflict, being peacemakers, doesn't mean that you just lie down and because actually that's not peace for you and for many others in the church. So Myrtle is turning into quite a complex character uh, in this. Uh, I didn't know she existed beforehand. Um, key ways of managing your own anxiety, however, in trying to, or a, a church, um, key ways that churches manage their anxiety is to find a scapegoat, i.e. Myrtle. It's all Myrtle's fault. Let's blame Myrtle. Finding that one person, in a way, identified patient. It's all Myrtle. We've got to sort Myrtle. And then everything will be fine. The other key way to reduce anxiety in a church is triangulation. We go and talk to someone else about it. Quentin's having problems with Myrtle, so Myrtle goes off and talks to Doris. Myrtle feels a lot better. Her anxiety is eased. Doris's anxiety is now sky high. So Doris goes off and talks to Jasper. Doris feels better, but Jasper feels really worried. And Jasper's heard that Myrtle has a problem with Quentin, but Quentin's his best friend, and why is Quentin... I wouldn't have thought that about Quentin, says Jasper. Then Doris says, do you not believe me? And Jasper goes, no, I don't believe you. And Doris says, well, it is true. And Jasper says, no, it's not. And Jasper and Doris fall out. And Jasper goes off and talks to Frank. And Frank says, oh, I can believe that about Myrtle or Quentin, or whoever, I've got confused now. But can you see how this just goes, this triangulation? And this is why conflict's never just between one or two people. It grows. So, oh, that's what I wanted you to do. Would you describe your mission area as anxious? What are the signs that the churches handle anxiety well or less well? Is there evidence of scapegoating or triangulation? So that's the first thing I'd like you to think about in your annual tables. And then if you get, we've only got five minutes for this, I'm not giving you very long to talk. Uh, you might choose one of these to talk about. What makes you anxious within congregational life? Okay, so would you describe your mission area as anxious? And if so, what are the signs that your church handles anxiety well? Is there evidence of scapegoating or triangulation? What makes you anxious yourself within congregational life? Maybe the second one's the one to stick with, actually, for the moment. What makes you anxious? But either of them. So, have a chat. about all this stuff. So uh, I'm trying to throw as much stuff at you <laughs> this morning, uh, which is why it's rather me heavy. So apologies for that. Just before we take a break, I want to offer you some uh, uh, something away of, uh, that I have found really helpful in managing my own anxiety. Uh, and um, it is the process of what we call self-differentiation. Uh, we all hold in tension two things. The need to be ourselves as individuals, the need to be me, <laughs> with our hopes, our dreams, our visions, our, yeah, the essence of what 
we want to bring to our work and our life as, as uh, ministers for God. The need to be me. But we are also part of a community. And there is that force for togetherness, to be part of. We are community. In other words, the need to be we. Now, this is particularly today the focus for us as uh, for you as oversight ministers and, and for, for myself in ministry. But actually, it's true for anybody in any community group, uh, even in any family, that we are ourselves as individuals, but we're also part of a whole. It may be a family or it may be a community or a sports group or a church. And those different pressures on us, the need to be me, but also the need to be we to be an individual, but also that sense of togetherness. If the scale too, tips too much, and it becomes all about me, wait a minute, yes, the middle, the middle place, that the balance, keeping that in balance, that's what we call the place of self-definition, to define yourself. If we get too much one way, uh, sorry, that says self-definition. It's not very clear. I can see someone going like this. <laughs> uh, a grey wall. I didn't know we had a grey wall. No, but there we go. Uh, mind you, it's on white, so it probably wouldn't show anyway. Um, if it's all about me, 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 I'm the most important. It's all about me. I'm the one that matters. My thoughts, my hopes, my vision, my way then we come to the point of emotional cutoff. We, you know, if it's too much that way, we cut off emotionally and connectively from the, the, to get the group. So that area of emotional cutoff is the extreme. The extreme at the other side is what we call emotional fusion, where we lose sight of what matters to us, that just goes. And we become so totally fused with the other, the group, what they want, what they feel, what they believe. Now, both of those two ends of the spectrum are unhealthy and cause dis-ease in the system. So it's trying to define yourself. So it's about knowing yourself, knowing who you are, knowing your dreams, your visions, your hopes, so that you can walk towards the other. You, our anxiety increases when we have that, uh, when, we're, when we, yes, when we can be easily swayed or when, we, we, need, we need to keep the connection with people so that we can be changed and moved, but not so changed and moved that we just become fused with them. But equally, and we lose sight what matters to us. But if it's all about what matters to us, we lose connection with the other. Does that make sense to you? I know it's a bit garbled. It's finding that point of self-definition knowing who you are so that you can walk towards the other and connect with them to find out who they are and what they need. And if there is, if there is um, so for example, in our church, like a lot of churches, the Baptist Union are doing a consultation at the moment on our, uh, our ministerial rules accreditation rules around human sexuality. So every church has to fulfill, fill in a consultation questionnaire. Every minister has to do uh, their minister's questionnaire. But as a minister, I have to make sure my church fills in their questionnaire, but I can't lead the church through the questionnaire because it's the church's questionnaire. I get my questionnaire. How do I work with my church? on that. 
How do people work within the church together on that? And part of it is working and managing our anxieties, working out where we, what we feel, so that we can walk towards the other to genuinely learn of them so that we can have open, honest, careful, that's not dismissing other viewpoints, but is engaging with. There are no quick fixes in all, in all this. How can we help our congregations and churches to manage their anxieties? How do we avoid becoming part of the problem and set the mobile swinging madly? And one of the best things we can do is try and manage our own anxiety. So as you go to coffee, you can go to go to coffee singing, actually I won't do that, singing the mantra to three by mice. No, not three by mice. Frere Jaca. <laughs> stay connected, stay connected. Self-define, self-define. Non-anxious presence, non-anxious presence. Keep your nerve, keep your nerve. Okay? Stay connected. Walk towards people. Even in your anxiety, don't let your anxiety mean that you don't engage with them. Stay connected, self-define, know who you are. <sighs> Try and be that non-anxious presence because anxiety spreads like nothing else. You think COVID-19 was contagious, it's got nothing on anxiety. It spreads so quickly. You have to be the swan and keep your nerve because when you don't react, when you don't, when they press your buttons and you don't react, they will press the buttons even harder. When Myrtle doesn't get the reaction she's expecting, she will go for it. Some of you may tip more towards issues, some of you may tip more towards relationship. It will depend who the conflict is with, what the conflict is about. Back in the 1970s, 1980s, there were uh, a lot of work done on our conflict management styles. Um, various people who decided that they were going to create categories for us all to respond to conflict. Again, we've got another straightforward, I don't do complicated graphs because I can't understand them, uh, but this is a very simple one. But the two axes are the vertical one is relationships, the horizontal one is issues and goals. And various consultants and facilitators thought about how we manage conflict. And Probably the most popular uh, was the one created by Kilman, uh, Tom, well, two people, Thomas and Kilman. Uh, I can't remember their first names. And they came out with these five conflict management styles that said, uh, depending on how much you value the relationship from low to high, how much you value the issue depends where you will be in your conflict management style. So some people who put a low value on relationship, low value on an issue, they're the avoiders, the people who will avoid conflict. They liken them to a turtle or a tortoise, but withdrawing into their shell, let it all go on. And they're in a way kind of, they lose out on the relationships, but they also lose out on the issue or the goal. Then there are others, say Thomas and Kilman, who are the smoothers or the accommodators, the people who highly value the relationship. And because they highly value the relationship, they will let go of the personal goals. If they don't get what they want, well, it doesn't matter. They've got a good relationship. They haven't upset them. Everyone's okay. We get on still. The smoothers, the accommodators. So they win on the relationship, but they lose 
on the issue or the goal, they give in. Then the opposite of the smoother, of course, is the forcer. Oh, sorry, they likened the smoother to a teddy bear. Um, the forcer is likened to the shark. These are the people who highly value the issue or the goal. They will go out to win. Uh, th their point of view, their way, this is the way we do it. And if they lose on the relationship, well, that's a shame, but tough, really. So they win on the goal, but they lose on the relationship. And then in the middle is the canny fox, the compromiser, the people who have a kind of a medium. You know, they do value the issue and they will work quite hard at it. They also value the relationship and they'll work hard at that and they'll find the middle ground, win some, lose some, finding the compromise. But then they also say there is the partner, or they called it the collaborator. But when you're working in places like Northern Ireland, the word collaborator does not go down well. <laughs> um, partner. These are people who highly value the relationship, highly value the issue, and will come to that collaborative, creative way forward that keeps win on relationship, win on the issue. I have a problem with that. I don't like people putting me into a box and I don't think I should put other people into boxes and label them. I find the labels quite pejorative and judging. I mean, who's rushing to be an avoider? Who's rushing to be a forcer? Uh, it's kind of quite judging in the way they describe them. Um, I also don't like it because it doesn't take into account the issue. It, you know, what, what, are, what is the conflict about? If I've just been shortchanged in a shop or someone has, uh, you know, carved me up in the bush away, I might be quite strong. <laughs> if the conflict's with my husband or daughter, I may be more of an accommodator. It doesn't take into account the relationship, doesn't take into account the issue, what they are. I think we can be all of these at different times. And sometimes there's a place to be all of these. That's the other thing it doesn't take into account. Sometimes it's right to be an avoider. And sometimes it's right to be a forcer, an accommodator, compromiser. I do like it because it reminds me that there are options of the way I can behave. And uh, it's actually not just going with perhaps my personal preference. If I don't like conflict, I might automatically avoid it, but actually I can walk towards it. You know, uh, uh, it's remembering their options. I also like it because it does hold out the hope of something better than a compromise. And I do get frustrated when I hear people almost setting a compromise as their goal. We must find a compromise. We must compromise. Well, actually, I would like to do something better than compromise. Uh, and I think it just reminds me of that. So I'm not dissing it completely. Uh, and I offer it to you. If this is a, this, I have to say this whole area of work has been the most life-giving stuff to me. Um, when I discovered the Gilmore Fraley uh, style profiles, which I did with Bridge Builders back in 1999, and I'm now a facilitator for Gilmore Fraley, uh, which takes a different way of looking at our individual management of self in conflict, in stress, in storm situations. Gilmore and Fraley do a questionnaire that you can do, and they call it a guide through calm and storm. So it takes the guesswork out of dealing with people. Well, that only really works if everybody else has done their Gilmore Fraley uh, style profile. But the reason I like it is because they will say, they say there are various things that affect the way we behave, how we're feeling, our stamina, are we tired? Are we energized? Have we just come back from holiday? Is this a new conflict that's just come up? 
Or is it something that's been going on for years? Are we ground down by it? Are we struggling with other life issues? So our stamina, that will affect our behavior. The situation will affect our behavior. Who the conflict's with, what it's about. Our skill level, how skillful are we at communicating, managing, negotiating, we can learn conflict management skills. more um, present, obvious to you. What I'd like you to think, and we probably won't get time to do this together as a group, but we might get a chance to start, but it may be something, I don't know what Bill's hoping to do with you this afternoon, but it may uh, be a helpful thing to take into this afternoon. And um, I'm going to explain those three things, the conflict puzzle, the stages of combustion, the group discussion map as a way that sometimes we can understand, we can make sense of what's happened. We can do, do what Sally has just explained, uh, describes, taking that situation and trying to see what's going on and why it's affecting us the way, way it is. So, um, this is a way of what we call mapping conflict. This is called conflict mapping. And, um, First of all, I'd like to show you the conflict puzzle. So when I'm doing this for real, and I do do it, I draw, it's not really working, I draw out on a piece of paper 
the, the puzzle shape. And then I write on it. So I go to a situation, maybe, uh, let's imagine I was called by uh, uh, an oversight minister who's working with the team uh, and there are tensions in there for whatever reason. Uh, and I'm trying to work out what's going on, who's what. The first thing I will try and find out is the behaviour. What is the behaviour? What's happened? So as a simple way, I'll take an example of a school, a child coming home from school. Child comes home from school, she throws her bag on the table and shouts, I hate school, I'm never going back, and runs out the back door and slams it behind her. That would be her behaviour. What would it, what, it, on my jigsaw, I write, throws bag, Slams door, then it's not working at all. Uh, ooh, what's happened here? It's three to four hours, it says. Please try to read that. Take yeah. care of your eyes and have a rest. Well, rest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What a what a considerate project. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. 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 Uh, yes. yes. Uh, hopefully you haven't been staring at it. Uh, uh, yeah, so you write on your puzzle what the behaviour is. So if someone in your church or uh, community or whatever, I'd write down the behaviour in the first section of the box. And then I would think about what are the feelings. So that's the behaviour. I don't think that's very clear. These are the feelings. So if a child had come in and thrown her bag, slammed the door, shouted, there's the behaviour. What is she feeling? Upset. Angry. Her, don't know. But she will be feeling something. She will be feeling something which led to this behaviour. What are the feelings? Fear, upset, anger, whatever they might be. So if you were doing this for a situation in the church, you write down what the behaviour was, and then you do a bit of speculation. What are these people feeling? What's this vocal minister feeling that's led for them saying what they did to me. That's what they said. What are they feeling? I don't know, but let me just wonder. Then you put on the issues, the why. Why are they feeling fearful? Why are they feeling upset? Why is this girl who's thrown her back and shouted, I hate school, I'm never going back. She's obviously angry and upset and fearful, uh, why? What's happened? Maybe she got told off. Maybe she failed a test. But something will have happened that causes these feelings that leads to this behaviour. So with your focal minister who may have objected to something, what might they be feeling? Why? What caused those feelings? And then the last one is the relationships. Remember that triangling that we talked about earlier? Who else is involved? Who else do you need to be thinking about, listening to, taking into account? Because it's never just one person, one situation. So I'd, with a child, it might be the teacher, it might be our friends, we should call out the friends, whatever. The reason I do this, and I do do it, I map it out and sometimes write on a piece of paper with these, with these categories, not always, but sometimes it can help me make it easier to work. Because it's very, very easy for me <coughs> to do both 
from the behavior to the issue. The child has done it, why? Right, what do I need to sort it out? She's come in, she's said, I hate school, I'm never going back, I'm straight up down the garden after her. Why? What's happened? Right, you got told off. Well, I'm not doing that, and I'm up to the school to sort it out. What I haven't taken into account is her feelings. When I just connect behaviour and issues, I'm missing that deeper stuff. Because feelings don't just go away. If you've got a focal minister who's being, I don't, not, don't want to put them on, into, into boxes, but if there is challenging behaviour that you are, if you just work on what's causing that and try to deal with that behaviour, you're not recognising the feelings and those feelings will bubble up and come out and then you'll have to deal with the next bit of behaviour and then you'll have to deal with the next bit of behaviour. And it never just happens in isolation, so you need to think about relationships. In a way, if you concentrate on what's happened, you're still in the area of conflict management, which is where we started this morning. It's when you take the whole in and think about more, you're in the area of conflict transformation, transforming the situation. Do not forget people's feelings. And do not forget that it's never just been a simple cause. It's never just that Merkel is a difficult person. It's not that simple. Another way of mapping that I have found quite helpful is to, again, I, I work on images, so I go back to the fire images. When a fire arises, there has to be something that catches light. There has to be some kindling. There has to be, in a way, the right conditions. What is the kindling? So uh, a few years back, about back at the um, early, 2003, I think, 2001, 2003, we had the disturbances in Burnley. Uh, we were living in Burnley at the time, we had the riots. Uh, and with the community, we did end stages of combustion that. The kindling of the Burnley riots was the poverty, the divided communities, <coughs> the rise of the BNP, uh, and loads of other things. But poverty was key. In the conflicts that arise in your churches or in your communities, what's the kindling? What is the what is the what's waiting to catch hold? What's the spark? Was it something someone said? Was it something something did someone did? What's the spark that came to the kindling? You then get the blaze. You have to manage the blaze. You have to pour water on it. That's not clear at all. The sun's shining. But that's a blaze, and then there's a fire ship squirting water on it. And you put the blaze out, but don't forget the embers, because there will still be heat. So sometimes I, what I do with situations, I, I, I and I put it, there's five categories. And the most important category, yes, oh, well, they're all important, but don't forget the embers because you only need to throw a bit more kindling on the embers and you get the blaze all over again and it becomes a cyclical thing. And a final way is some of you who are a bit more wordy, you might be able to read any of that, that's far too zero. But it's basically a spider diagram. That's a a group discussion map. I've got small children during Sunday worship, and I divide the page up into different kind of sections of who's needs. So the who is the small children up here. That if the who is the small children, their needs are to be loved and accepted, valued and taught, and their fears are being unwanted. You might not know that, but that's what's there. And so on, the members without small children, what are their needs, what are their fears? 
minister, clergy, leadership, what are their needs, what are their fears, parents of small children, what are their needs, what are their fears, and I just put it out so that no one gets forgotten. In other words, it's complexifying rather than simplifying. So the last thing I want to leave you with at one o'clock is complexify rather than simplify. Conflict is never a one, two, although I did offer you that dynamic at the beginning, it doesn't work like that. It's not a linear, it's an all over the shop. Conflict is like that tangled ball of wool. And what you can do is ease the tangles. If you find that you need help, please, please ask for help. It is not failure. When we become unwell in our bodies, we go to the doctors. We might self-medicate first. But at some point, we recognise, actually, this is something serious, I need help. There are people who can help you. And it is not failure, in fact, quite the opposite. It is actually taking responsibility, not running away from it, walking towards it. Uh, I did, did say I'm happy to be contacted. Uh, my cards are there, but there are other people who work in this area, Bridge uh, Lewis as well, and um, yeah, just please use us, because if we get called in to help uh, at the right level, it can become an opportunity. If it's left too late, it can be that level four, level five, and that Thank you so much for your time and attention. I have given you more input than uh, perhaps, um, yeah, but I hope it's been helpful input and uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to squeeze into a morning really what I would like, ideally have liked to have given a whole day to, um, so perhaps you can invite me back another time. <laughs> um, I did say, uh, I'll give you a plug for my daughter's play. Uh, she is an actor, she's written a play called The Lighthouse, it's on at uh, Theatre Delhi in Sheffield on the 13th and the 14th of October, so quite soon. Um, this has had the most phenomenal response. Uh, it, she's written it herself, uh, she's had quite phenomenal funding from the Arts Council, and people are talking about it quite excitedly, with some reviewers saying, the best piece of theatre they've seen, which she's absolutely astonished by. Of course, no one knows her, no one, her name's not out there, so people don't know of it. It's her story of living with someone uh, uh, with, who was at the point of taking their own life. Um, and uh, sounds depressing, it's choice. It's a love letter to life. Uh, it is hopeful, uh, and it is about mental health. Um, it's only an hour and a quarter, but it is an hour and a quarter of something really good. I, I know I'm saying that as a mother. Uh, it is really good. If you want to see a preview of it, uh, if you go onto Leeds Playhouse um, website, there is a trailer where you where you get some of the. Uh, Details about it. Mm -hmm. Give the title of the play again. The, the title is called The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse, and the venue in local? It's Theatre Delhi in Sheffield on the 13th or the 14th of September. And I've abused my position unashamedly to, to publicise that. Thank you very much. And thank you.